Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Lord's house on this Sunday morning. It's very good to have all of you here. It's beautiful out. And we can truly appreciate that. There are a number of announcements that uh, need to make. First, as noted in your bulletin, uh, next week is our community church service. We are having it at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. It was initially at 10.30, but the July 4th committee of the because of stuff they're doing, requested us to move it to 10. And then you can go to a community luncheon, bingo, and all kinds of other stuff that's at the community center after the, afterwards. We also then will probably not get to see the new pastor from the Methodist Church, though I'm hoping, uh, since he's going to be down in Oakville at 9. Uh, so I don't know that he'd be able to make it back in time, but I'm going to be in contact with him this week and tell him he's welcome at any point. Is it here? It's here. Yeah. We are hosting, I'm preaching, um, etc. Just remember it's 10 a.m. next week and should be a joint service. Pamela has asked that you folks stay after church to help decorate or redo the things in the chancel area uh, for next week. So if you would please be willing to do that, she would appreciate it greatly. She can't do it all on her own. Uh, and then, though this is a little bit ahead of time, uh, July 10th and July 17th, uh, I will be on vacation. And you will be having Marta Pomeroy preaching. You have had, she's been here before. So you can look forward to that. Are there any other announcements that we need to make at this time? Well, if not, then let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to Pamela play My Tribute.
Yeah, isn't that a great way to start the service? Very rousing. Please stand as you're able and join me with the responsive call to worship printed in your bulletin. We come together this day drawn by the light of God's love. In God's eternal kingdom, darkness and despair are vanquished. In God's eternal realm, peace and hope reign. Let all the people praise God with their music and their voices. Let all the people praise God with their deeds of loving kindness. Praise be to God. Amen. Our welcoming hymn is number 40, 432, Only Believe. This is one of those ones that you'll be kind of just humming to yourself all day. Responsive reading today is totally in unison as opposed to being responsive. Oh gosh. My apologies. Back to our reading today entitled The Comforter based on uh, verses from John. Let not your heart be troubled. You are trusting God. Now trust in me. There are many homes up there where my father lives and I am going to prepare them for your coming. When everything is ready, then I will come and get you, so that you can always be with me where I am. If this weren't so, I would tell you plainly. 
If you love me, obey me, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, and he will never leave you. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart, and the peace is give isn't fragile like the boost the world gives, so don't be troubled or afraid. In Galatians, Paul lays out the ways our desires lead us to oppose the Spirit. Before we hear the word read and proclaimed, let us confess our sins before our God. Please join me at the prayer and confession printed in your bulletin. Lord, you know how easy it is for us to sit here, tethered to our darkness and fear. We get bound up by chains of mistrust. We dare not to hope, for so many times before we have been disappointed. So we sit here and wonder where you are. We are not unlike the disciples who wondered also, who feared. Lord, come to us in our darkness. Flood us with your powerful light of love and mercy. Help open our eyes to the good news of your eternal glory. Give to us visions of the place in which love and hope will reign. Forgive our stubborn resistance to your mercy and your love. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ has set us free. Claim your forgiveness. Rejoice in God's grace. Respond with love. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination printed in your bulletin. Open our hearts and minds by the power of your spirit, holy God, that we might hear and receive the message you intend for us today. Amen. Our first scripture this morning is from 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 through 24, which is found on page 555-556 in your pew Bible. When Elijah showed up at the gate to Zarephath, asking for water and then for food, he probably looked more like a hungry beggar than someone who could help a poor starving widow and her son. And the widow, not only nearly destitute, but resident of a town in non-Jewish territory that had no reason to welcome a Jewish prophet, must have seemed an unlikely source of hospitality, shelter, and feed Elijah. But God had arranged this meeting, and he used these two people and their willingness to trust in him to provide for the needs of both. That trust was further tested when the son later sickened and died. But God used this occasion also to build trust in him. 1 Kings 17, 8 through 24. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was standing there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. 
Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Some time later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, have you brought tragedy also upon this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Our second reading today is Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. Throughout Scripture, we are told that God cares about the widow and the orphan because they often have no one else to care about them. Jesus exemplifies this caring when he raises the son of the widow of Nain. The people who witness this are in awe, not just because of what Jesus did, but because it shows that God is at work among them, and they look forward to what God would continue to do to help his people. Luke 7, 11 through 17. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with great awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It amazes me continually about how God's plan can be made manifest sometimes through the simplest of things. The scriptures that were chosen today came from the lectionary, which as far as I know, they set the lectionary up back in 1983, 1993, I can't remember which decade, well over 20 years ago. And yet, as I went through the week and heard about what happened at Yarmouth, I couldn't help but recognize the application for us today. I'm sure you all know, but there were two men that were caught in a silo that fell. Uh, one of them died and is uh, was the father of a young daughter 
seven years old and a young wife. Uh, and it's a tragedy. It's always a shame to those of us involved when someone dies. And when someone young dies, then it seems like it's even worse. Many of you have experienced the death of a spouse or even a child. And there can probably be no greater pain than that. We are expecting to outlive, or for our children to outlive us. At some point, it will likely happen to most of us. For each of us, it will be different and yet the same. It will leave us with tears in our eyes and pain in our hearts. We call them tragedies. Something that seems to turn our lives upside down. Because we live in a fallen world, these things will come our way. It may be a tragedy similar to the one that the woman in the Old Testament lesson and our Gospel lesson both experienced. Someone close to us, whom we dearly love, may die unexpectedly. Many other tragedies could occur, like broken relationships, body broken by disease, broken hopes or dreams, even some national or global tragedy may impact us. Things are too numerous to list and too different to summarize. And all we can say is tragedies are often a part of life. Since the Holy Spirit has worked faith in our hearts, we are confident that God is with us always and that He will always work everything out to our eternal good, as it says in Romans. And yet when tragedy strikes our lives, that faith will be tested. We will be tempted to blame ourselves or others or even God for what happens to us or those we love. And in our pain, we may be also tempted to cry out, Why, Lord? Why did you allow this to happen? For our, part of our lesson today, I need us to consider what do we do when tragedy strikes? Do we try to find someone to blame, which, by the way, is totally natural? Or do we respond with prayer and faith? Now you may know the background for some of the scriptures, uh, uh, for the verses in the Old Testament. Uh, under the leadership of King Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel, God's people were worshiping idols, false gods. In addition to the sin of idolatry, the majority of the people were also living their lives contrary to God's commandments. And because of this situation, God used Elijah to pronounce a curse on the land of Israel, saying that there would be no rain or dew for several years. Three and a half, to be exact, as it turned out. Of course, no prophet is appreciated when they speak prophetically and if they act on God's call. So he was pretty much hated and a hunted enemy of King Ahab. And there's lots of stories about that time. And one of the times when he was moving around, because he didn't stay in one place, the Lord told him to go to a town called Zarephath. And as we heard in the beginning of the reading, God used a miracle to continue to feed his prophet and the widow and her son. Now, it's important for us to note that this widow was a pagan. She was not a Jew. <coughs> Yet she was still impacted by the famine. 
and she was ready to have her last meal with her young son and then die when Elijah came. But instead, they got this jar of oil and jug of flour that never became empty. I've always wondered about that. Do you use it up and then when you look back in, it's you know back to where it was? Is it constantly welling up? Did you get tired after three and a half years of bread cakes? They were living an everyday miracle from God. But then, it being a fallen world, tragedy struck. And the widow's son became sick. And in time, he died. And the widow reacted like you might expect. The first thing she said was to Elijah saying, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? I mean, Elijah was a prophet. He was obviously working this miracle. She knew this, and so she seemed to assume he had the power to take her son's life. But her words reveal something more. She was blaming God for the tragedy, and in a sense was blaming herself, because she brought up her past sins, whatever they may have been, and speculated that God was somehow punishing her for the things she had done. And isn't that the way things often work in our life? Even if it isn't a tragedy, perhaps some small setback or inconvenience, we immediately want to blame someone. Perhaps we blame those around us, we blame God, or ultimately ourselves. Because like the widow of Zarephath, we think God is punishing us for our sins. It's so easy when we ask why to blame ourselves. Not in our scripture today, but in another point in time, there's a blind man that the apostles see, a man born blind. And the apostles verbalize a Jewish belief that your sins are what causes your curses during your life. And so they asked Jesus, since he was born blind, was it the man's sin or his parents' sin that caused him to be born blind? And Jesus said, neither, but that the gl glory of God might be shown. And then he healed the blind man. Long time to wait, though, 38 years. God's timing is not the same as ours. We have tragedies. We ask why. And we have to turn to God as Elijah did. And hope, not necessarily for a revival or resuscitation or that supernatural healing, although those are always a wonderful thing when they happen, but rather that God hear our prayer and respond. And the New Testament passage shows us that God will, even more so than with Elijah. Jesus was going into the town of Nain, and he had a huge crowd with him. Very popular, you know, he'd fed the 4,000, and so there was food there, kind of like with the widow and, and Elijah. And he'd been doing healings and miracles, and so I don't know if it was like a circus or a parade, but definitely a large group of people. And the contrast is interesting because as they, this parade of life was going in, a parade of death was coming out. The widow had lost her son. I'm sure there was weeping and wailing because they had professional mourners. And it said that even the poorest of widows should have at least two flutists and someone to cry for them. To help verbalize 
if you will, the grief that was going on. And it said that the town, most of the town was actually following her. I don't know what position the young man held or what position the widow had socially, since widows were tended to be second class, even more so than women in general. A lot of them had no means of support on their own. But the whole town was going out with her. And in front of this whole town and in front of the people that... Jesus brought with him, he did something completely out of everyone's expectations. And the reason why he did it is important to us. You see, he went up and he touched the casket. Now, that automatically would have made him ritually unclean, at least by the Pharisaic law. Just as if he, when he touched the lepers. And supposedly then he would become ritually unclean. But instead the lepers were cleansed. Well in this case he touches the casket and he says, Don't cry anymore. You know he asked that other places. When he raises Jairus' daughter and there's professional mourners there, he says, why are you weeping? She's not dead, but only asleep. And they, they stop their wailing and they mock him. Probably until the girl came out. And then I'm sure they were flabbergasted. And Jesus tells the young man that's in the casket, get up. And the young man sat up and began talking. Now we've all heard stories, I'm sure, about how, you know, uh, sometimes a, a dead body will suddenly, through muscle spasms or other things, move. And I don't know about you, but I would have freaked out. I would not have been praising God despite the fact that it says it did. Maybe later. But the first thing I would have been doing is saying, oh my God. And being very scared. I'm sorry, I'm a coward. But he went and he touched the casket did something that would have made him in the eyes of everyone unclean. And he did it, it says, because he had compassion on the widow. His heart was moved. She didn't ask for help, unlike the widow of Zarephath. She wasn't blaming Jesus. I mean, this was a done deal. They were taking the young man out to bury him. And yet, she experienced and they experienced a visit of the divine. Because God had compassion for her. You know, that compassion that God has, that love that God has, extends to each one of us. We are dead in our sins, deader than that young man was. Deader than the boy of the widow of Zarephath was. To God. And yet, while we were still sinners, He reached out and made a way for us to be forgiven, to be reconciled, and to come alive. Not because he had some ulterior motive. Not because he benefited in some way from it, as we had that series on the resurrection during Easter. You know that there's no practical benefit for God having saved us. He just wanted to. Because he loves us. And even when tragedy strikes in our lives, we need to remember the compassion and love of God. 
Because if God showed us that kind of compassion and love, then we need to show that kind of compassion and love to others. Especially when tragedy hits. Now the community responded amazingly in Yarmouth. I, I read in one of the articles where the now widow said, stop bringing food. Because I have so, we have so much that we're not going to be able to deal with it all. That seems to be one of our primary responses. At least it has been in all my years of going to church. If we're going to celebrate, if we're going to comfort, we cook. But you know, what she might need now even more than that is someone to just be beside her. Both her and her daughter. To listen. To offer help. If she doesn't know God, to share the hope that we have even during this time of tragedy. And you need to be willing to be vulnerable and open up and maybe speak of some tragedy in your own life, not so you can compare them, but so that she can understand that you are empathizing with her. You feel what she feels and you sympathize with her. You are there with her, even as God is. Because God knows the way we feel. He went through it himself. That's part of why Christ came. To experience incarnate being a human being. And as it says in Hebrews, he was tempted in every way as we were yet without sin. So it wasn't just the positive aspects. He experienced the negative ones. His dad died while he was still young. We know that because Joseph didn't arrange any kind of marriage and Jesus was the sort of the head of the household and the family business. Stuck around till he was 30 because that's what the Jewish law said. Before he went out on his ministry. So I'm guessing that before Jesus was 20, Joseph had died. He may have experienced the loss of a sibling. We don't know. That's not covered in Scripture. Ultimately, he experienced the loss of his own life and all of our sin as he was separated from the Father because of it. But Jesus said, It is finished. And he accomplished what he came to do. And because of that, we know that God will continue to be with us. To never leave us nor forsake us. To have been preparing a place for us in heaven. And to give us hope during those times when in this world tragedy strikes. That doesn't make it hurt any less, perhaps. That doesn't make it any, more any less difficult to deal with the aftershocks, perhaps. But what it does do is give us a promise, a goal, a future that we can continue to hold on to and anchor in the storm. I would challenge you to be an anchor for others. Not dragging them down, but being that solid rock during their storms of life. Sharing that hope with them. The hope that comes through the knowledge of the love of God in Jesus Christ. And who knows? God does good things 
will be worked out of it. And you will be faithful to the God who loved you first. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you would turn with me to number 338, Revive Us Again in our hymnal. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for the Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise Thee, O God, for Thy Spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with Thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. We ask for revival. We ask for comfort. We ask for enthusiasm. A lot of those can come from having a thankful heart. Remembering what God did. And having gratitude. As... Pamela plays Offertory in E-flat by Beethoven. Think upon the benefits and the good things that God has given you and consider how you might give back to his work with others. Please join me in our unison prayer of dedication. 
Most generous God, you have blessed us with gifts to serve and share. May the offerings we present today be used to further your kingdom and build your beloved community. Amen. Please be seated. And just so you're aware with that prayer of dedication, which Bob had selected, that's not a typo. It wasn't supposed to be kingdom, but rather kingdom, as written, since we're all brothers and sisters and children of God. Where have you seen God? this week. Is there anyone that would like to share a God sighting or a testimony about something? Let's come before God in prayer. God, our Heavenly Father, Dad, you're an awesome God and you're an awesome Dad. You love us with an everlasting love, and we give you praise and glory for that. Even when tragedy strikes, you use that to help us grow and to draw closer to you if we only open ourselves up to your presence and to your people. Lord, we give you thanks for the tight-knit nature of these small towns and the supportiveness that they show one another. And we pray that we would have the opportunity to share with them who mourn the hope we have. And we pray for healing in hearts, torn asunder by what happened. We pray for those that are sick and are hurt, whether it be spiritual, physical, or mental. Lord, make them whole to serve your purposes and to do your will. You know the people that were spoken of. So many falls, so many broken bones, kidney problems, Things that just ultimately are part of our being human. But we pray for each of them and their recovery. We pray for their families to not only help them, but in several cases there's other severe needs that even predated their fall. Help them cope. And may we, may we take the opportunity whenever it shows itself to stand alongside them. Even as you have stood alongside us. And Lord, we pray for the day to come soon when all of these things will be in the past and there will be no more tears of sorrow. There will be no more sickness, no more death. Jesus, Prince of Peace, come back soon. Bring your peace to the entire world. And every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord. Holy Spirit, until that day, while we know you are with us in our head, if we read the scriptures, help us to know in our hearts. Give us wisdom and insight to see how best to show compassion, how best to reach out. Give us courage of heart to do so instead of sitting back and not taking the chance but putting ourselves out there 
even if it might mean rejection or a stumble, and give us perseverance in our spirits so that we might be able to continue on fighting the good fight, running the race that has been set before us, and through it all glorifying you. And Holy Spirit be poured out upon this church. Keep it from evil. Lord, may we be a light in the darkness of this world that draw others to you. And may we impact our community so that others come to know the same love and grace and mercy that we ourselves have already experienced. And then together we might celebrate and give you praise and glory for the wondrous things you have done. And we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, the same we taught his disciples when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you would stand as you're able. And join me in the green gospel hymnal as we sing number 98. How long has it been?